I'll try one more time. I think it's recording. I believe I recorded. I think. Yes, it is. Uh, all right, cool. Okay. Yeah, I see, right, the, I see the red dot. Cool. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Greg Iannarella. Um, my students call me Professor Greg. You can just call me Greg. Um, that's totally fine. Uh, let me um, let me just start by giving you a little background into sort of how I I fell uh, sort of backwards into uh, the world of um, data uh, and writing, right? And that that kind of where those two spaces uh, meet. So I've I've been an English professor here um, at Seton Hall for I think uh, now going on five five or six years, and uh, I was teaching in the first year writing program. And one of my big kind of early areas of, of research was trying to find ways that I could sort of inject politics into those courses in ways that um, weren't destructive, right, to the course, uh, <laughs> to the to the classroom, right, um, that uh, we could kind of create a community that could talk about politics uh, in a way that was both um, productive and interesting and didn't necessarily shy away from um, some of some of those kind of more hot topics. Uh, so that was kind of like my early area of interest when I when I started teaching here, and I presented a, a whole lot to to fellow colleagues about that um, and, and sort of strategies for that. Now, as my career sort of started developing, I I became really interested in in data and data science um, as as a totally separate thing, right? I was just you know I, I was taking online courses. Uh, I did a nano degree through Udacity. Um, I started, I took two graduate classes here um, at Seton Hall in the data science program. Um, so I was really interested in this idea and this concept of, of, of big data analytics. Uh, and so as I started um, uh, sort of taking those courses, one thing that I realized was what I was really good at, and maybe this is no surprise, but I was sort of worlds ahead of other people in my, in my classes. At, at writing, right, <laughs> at, at, um, at communicating. Uh, the technical side of things was where I was really slow, and the mathematics side of things, forget it, right? That was where I was just, you know, completely lost. Um, but the writing, no surprise maybe, was was where I, 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 I was shining. And it sort of got me thinking about, well, well why, is, why is data writing so hard for some of these people who clearly understand the concepts even better than me? But perhaps they just they just can't find ways to communicate them, um, and so I started thinking about data and data writing. And one thing that I really noticed was that as I was as I was writing about data for for different projects that I was taking in different courses, it was forcing me to write in ways that I perhaps had never thought about writing before, and. It was forcing me to actually write better, I thought. Um, it was forcing me to keep better track of sort of the ways in which I was researching, the process in which I was researching, when maybe in the past, um, you know, being an English major, I would just, I would go to the library and I'd sit there, you know, physically, right? And I would sort of let research happen to me. And I think in uh, the data world, I, I was more hands-on and conscious of the process, right, that I was going through. And so this sort of got me thinking, well, what if I could find some kind of a very low stakes way um, of bringing data, and, and by low stakes, I mean uh, low um, stress, right, for the students. How could I bring a, a low stress environment interaction with data to my students without making them feel like they need to understand data science, right, per se, or coding or, or any of that? So. Uh, I attended one of our wonderful workshops um, here at, at Seton Hall that's curated by that was curated by the librarians. Um, and uh, it was a policy map, uh, a policy map workshop. And I was sitting there and I'm thinking about my 1201 class where we talk so much about politics and I'm so insistent on on making that class feel relevant and, and cutting edge and uh, like there's real things at stake right for the the, the topics that they're talking about. And I realized this is perfect, right? For a persuasive essay, I could give students access to policy map and they can play around it. And that can be sort of their first stop when they're just developing their topics, right? They can allow this, um, and I'm gonna be referring to it as a sandbox. They can enter into this sandbox and they can find their topic in the sandbox in ways that I felt were 
and and excuse me for over speaking. I'm sure maybe some of you might roll your eyes at this, but for me, it was really revolutionary. I mean, I before we would have a one day class where I would ask them to sort of think about the topics that they'd like to write their persuasive papers on. And, you know, we would list, I would go around the board and I'd say, what are some hot topics you're interested in? And I would just write down topics and they would say things like, um, you know, marijuana legalization, gun control, you know, any of the kind of hot political topics at the time. And I would very much get the same exact papers, right, over and over and over again, um, which were, you know, marijuana legalization, gun control, um, uh, you know, abortion, um, you know, any of the persuasive papers that you come in contact with. And they would all be finding the same sources, right? They would go, and I love this tool, Opposing Viewpoints is also another database we have access to. Uh, they would go through Opposing Viewpoints and they'd find articles and they would do a kind of very, very cut and dry, they say, I say template, which is great, right? That's what we teach them. Once I started implementing this into my 1201 class, uh, I was getting topics that were just blowing me out of the water. Um, you know, these were students who, with no other real additional instruction or no other clear indicators that they were just better writers from year to year or whatever it might be, were now writing papers that were hyper focused, that had layered theses, right? That wasn't just, um, I believe that uh, we need more gun control for this reason, right? For XYZ, I'm kind of thinking on like a global kind of very broad macro scale. Now they're writing topics that are hyper local, that are sophisticated, right? That deal with all sorts of different um, layered points and arguments. And I'm going to show you some examples of that today. Now, that that all happened around the exact same time that I uh, I took on the the task of coordinating business writing. Um, I hadn't taught business writing before. Uh, so it was very much a, a brave new world for me, and um, I had to figure out, well, how am I going to how am I going to teach this class? I'm so used to teaching, you know, incredibly political works, or being in 1202 and teaching literature. So now here I am in business writing um, and trying to figure out how to be more, you know, professional technical writing. And it was like, you know, the the light bulb just clicked that I had all this now access and knowledge to this data world, which was at the time, I mean, a few years ago, um, was really up and coming, um, you know, in the big data as as a thing was really gaining kind of widespread, you know, people were talking about it just who, who weren't in industry. Um, and now it's really, right, it's really there. Um, and part and part, and something I'm gonna talk about a lot today because of the the digital transformation. Uh, that's that we've sort of that was supposed to take 10 years, right? And that had to happen basically in a few months um, in March. So uh, it's been this whole project has been a whole lot of blind luck um, and a whole lot of just sort of, uh, you know, a lot of things just sort of clicking. Um, but uh, so here's kind of the the finished result is what I have is a curriculum in business writing that uh, utilizes this this kind of crazy and wild idea called data narratives, which is this idea that students can learn to be better writers if they're writing using um, data software. And I'm gonna take you through kind of some of my reasoning behind that. And I'm gonna show you exactly how my, my course runs um, every single step of the way. So I have six steps that I kind of utilize to make sure that my students go from absolutely, and I don't assume any data knowledge, absolutely no data knowledge to as data literate as I can get them in, you know, four, what is it, three, three and a half, four months um, in a normal semester, in my summer session, six weeks, six weeks, in my winter sessions, three weeks, right? So it's, so I've really, you know, I've, I've run this course kind of in a, an incredibly fluctuated way. Um, so here's my, this is my ultimate kind of argument, right, um, for, for this, for this curriculum, which is that business and technical writing courses must make necessary leaps towards special topics brought on by a digitally transformed workplace, right? So the pandemic has forced us right into this space. And I, working with my business writing students, I really have the privilege of thinking a whole lot about my students' professional careers um, and trying to get them job ready, not just in a theoretical way, but in an incredibly practical way, right? Of just sending emails 
uh, I need to train my students to be digital citizens as best as I can. So I think that this is one of those ways that uh, the course is becoming sort of more embodied with that digital transformation so that it's still a primary writing course, but it just has digital facets to it. And I think that we do our students a disservice if we're not adapting our courses that way. Um, so, and, you know, of course, I, 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 I'll talk to anybody, you know, about that if, if they have any questions about that claim, but uh, I think that we're going to see students wanting and a demand for those skills across across the board, right, across the curriculum. Um, so such topics include an immediate understanding of data statistics and data visualizations, right? The digitally transformed workplace requires the uh, ability to research, present, and communi communicate in digital space to audiences with a wide spectrum of information digestion requirements. So um, let me explain that a little bit. Uh, in my business writing course, when I first took it over, it was entirely a uh, very linearly written course, right? So when we would do our initial assignment is an email assignment where they're asked to construct an email. Uh, it was just a written a written email, right? And I realized, okay, that's fine, you know, but what do my what do my emails look like when I send them out, especially if I'm pitching a new idea? Uh, you know, I'll have attachments, right? I'll have other things that I'm pointing to. I'll build in some links. I'll build in some other things. So I wanted to have students feel like, okay, you have this space, right? This technological space. And now I'm asking you to be a writer in that space. So instead of just asking them to type out essays, right? And then to do their work there, um, I wanted to give them a freedom, the freedom to take their writing skills and use them to navigate all different spaces because listen all the technological tools that i'm going to show you today five years from now they might be totally different right or look totally different um, but the one thing that's going to be the same is my students ability to navigate different tools and to become writers in those tools so we use all different tools for each different assignment and i want to make sure that they understand okay how does my audience How's my audience going to exist in this space as well, right? Um, so different information digestion requirements. Um, how do I create in this space, and how do how would I consume information here, right? And then our business and technical technical writing curriculum should reflect the, sh the shift in communication landscape and include projects that require students to develop argument in software sandboxes as they curate data, image, and outside source work into a cohesive and interactive narrative. Um, and I'm going to show you kind of how how they how they end right which is that interactive narrative um, portion but i really you know i've noticed that as far as research goes especially in the data world uh you have open source data you have um sort of software sandboxes that you can explore uh it's very much i think the name of the game is very much going into a piece of software and sort of playing around right and that's that's how research is happening um now and so I wanted to kind of create space for my students to explore that that side of research and that side of, of information creation. Uh, so what is a data narrative, right? Let's let's go back to square one. Um, it's a field of study. Uh, it, it's it's not something I invented. If if I invented anything, it's I I'm one of the few people who actually calls it data narrative. Uh, if you go out there and you Google data storytelling or data journalism, it's something that pops up all the time. Um, I think the narrative portion that I, I insist on calling it that is because I'm sort of teaching my students to be narrators, right? So as opposed to creating a journalistic piece um, or just simply telling a story, uh, I, I, they might have a presentation and they might have to narrate over that presentation or whatever it might be. So it feels more like a, you know, a narrator or someone who's, who's standing there giving this to people actively. Um, but it's a field of study that concerns itself with the necessity um, of high level storytelling and rhetorical skills to meet increasingly complicated data analysis questions. Um, it hopes to maximize information fluency by translating mathematical figures into the stories, the story of our lives, right? It strives to bring meaning um, to the data we create uh, and that we collect. Uh, and one of the inspirations that I've, that I've been having, especially since this pandemic started, is that I noticed that, uh, you know, more than ever, uh, the world is expecting us to be uh, statisticians, right? Um, and if you turn on the news, there's all sorts of statistics 
uh, and people don't really understand them. And so I think that the future is going to be much, much more data driven and just every every just normal, regular person is going to have to have some fluency with it. Uh, or, right, we're going to depend on the storytellers, the people who are actually writing this stuff to explain it proficiently. So this is kind of a two birds with one stone uh, type of thing. I want to give my students the ability to navigate that stuff and understand it, but also the ability to communicate it to people who perhaps are not 100% data literate in the way that maybe they are. Um, and why is this crucial to learning how to write? That's more of the theoretical stuff that I found as I was teaching this curriculum, which is that uh, I believe now after some of the things that I've, I've, I've noticed in my student writing that engaging with data fosters critical rhetorical skills at all stages of the writing process from research to highlighting and explaining bias, which is a really important one, to detailing the rhetorical situation. Uh, one of the main things that I'd like to leave you with by the end of this presentation is that uh, this is very much a powerful tool um, for bringing uh, issues and ideas over diversity and inclusion, different social justice initiatives into courses that perhaps um, don't necessarily have those already built in. Uh, and I'm going to kind of explain that as, as I move along. Um, and here's the basis for this claim. Uh, you know, I'm very much inspired by uh, Stanford University's work. Um, and a lot of the curriculum uh, is inspired by the existing research by Stanford University's Understanding Language team, uh, which uh, they have this, this concept called mathematical language routines, uh, which argues that recognizing and supporting students' language development processes in the context of mathematical sense making ultimately enables students to proficiently navigate discourse while developing pre key critical thinking and communication skills. Um, so I use the same basic core theory. Now, it, with their project, they're using it uh, mostly for, um, you know, second language students, right? English as a second language students. Um, and they, uh, they're working with this idea that if they kind of take the discourse and they, they latch it onto kind of mathematical concepts, that students learn the language better and they learn the mathematical concepts better. Um, if that makes sense. But so basically I'm using data language routine. So it's the same basic concept, but just data analysis sandboxing. Um, and it, there seems to be, you know, there seems to be something to it. Here's one of the, it's very inception-y, right? Here, recursion, here we go again. Um, here's one of the big benefits uh, that I was trying to explain um, earlier is that what the data sandboxes provide is it forces students to write in a shape that sort of begets better writing and better research. Uh, lots of our students, they see, okay, this is where I have to begin the assignment and I really just wanna get it over with as soon as possible and here's the straight line, right? And I can get from A to B as quickly as possible. Um, I don't care about, right, a core key concept that we have in rhetorical theory is discussing constraints. Um, they don't care about constraints usually. Uh, they don't think a whole lot about them. Um, the data sandbox, what's interesting about it, and I'm going to show you policy map in just a second. What's interesting about it is that there's clear constraints right there on the page that they really can't ignore. And if they do ignore them, I can write, pay attention to your constraints, which in a normal situation, a student doesn't know what that means. But I'm saying pay attention to your constraints and here's the picture that you literally put into your paper and they can see it, right? That connection is made in a much more profound way. But I argue that real writing and many of you who've done any, you know, real writing, you know that it has a shape and that shape is not linear, right? If I had to write for someone my writing process or draw it out, you know, it'd be like this, right? It's just like zigzags on a page that continuously loop back. We tell our students all the time, uh, your best writing is in your conclusion, go back, take your conclusion, go to the top and start from there, right? And start back over. Uh, students don't usually do that, um, but we know that real writing does that, right? We usually get our best ideas as we develop, we start developing these, these vocabulary utility belts, right? Our, the discourse that we use to discuss a topic and as we go, we return to those and we evolve them and we develop them. And we take on this kind of circular shape. The sandbox mimics that, 
uh, in a really cool way because as you play with your parameters, different things change on the map. And the way I section out my assignments, I have students keep track of that process. So I say, okay, if you set a certain parameter, what did you set the parameters at? As you change the parameters, how does the visualization actually change? Um, and then they're doing that kind of circular shape of revising their thesis statement based around actual movement in the data, right? We always stress that as students are researching, they should, if they come across something that sort of disproves their initial hypothesis, they should then go back, right, and revise. A lot of students would rather just ignore it, right, and just say, no, 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 no. that, you know, I never saw that. Um, I'm just going to stick with this because I've got all this work. Because this happens now way earlier in the process, right, they haven't even necessarily developed their argument yet. That recursion is happening right there um, before they even kind of put pen to paper. And I think that the results are just astounding. Um, like I get way better results and way, way less pushback. Here's that political bias thing that I wanted to uh, kind of focus on for, for the majority of it. Now, this is a business writing class, right? Um, and I had a problem with my business writing class, right? I, I came from 1201 and I was very used to injecting politics into my class in a, in a really profound way, you know, like teaching articles from all different viewpoints that I didn't feel like I necessarily had that opportunity in business writing in the same way, right? Like I could, I could have diversity inclusion sections, but it always felt like I had like a two week period where I was, I was fitting it in. It didn't feel like an organic part of the class. This has actually allowed me to, to make it more organic in the class because I'm, I know that I can do this now with more comfortably feeling like I'm not going to get that initial kind of pushback from students uh, who are assuming a political bias, right, one way or another, right? So do you have a bias problem in your classes? Uh, consider using data to introduce uh, diversity and social justice topics without the, the heat, right? Um, so one a topic that I'm absolutely fascinated by, uh, and this is kind of like extracurricular stuff, like this is, I'm more of a hobbyist in this, but a lot of my data science work, I'm really interested in sort of the heat maps of language, and I'm specifically interested in it as it pertains to um, the ways in which people are radicalized on the internet, right, uh, which has been kind of a hot topic in the media um, recently, which has just been fascinating. But um, language gives off associative heat, right? If we if we hear a certain word, it you know, if we hear a certain discourse, our students who might have one political leaning or another, it's just gonna it's gonna set off that heat trigger, right? So if I give them an article about a topic, and that heat trigger is you know gets set off, you know maybe that's two or three students out of thirty that I just lost, and I you know I don't want to lose any, right? So um, how can I do this in a way that the political kind of ideologies are there, but they're there with the pure data, right? Before, before we talk about bias, before we talk about anything, which are important topics, and we, well, of course we get to them eventually, but how do I make sure that I slowly ease them into this environment without losing anybody? Data is, is I think, how you do it, right? Because it's, of course, there's, there's bias in how data is collected and how it's curated, but when they see the numbers for themselves and they're the ones who are building the numbers in these sandboxes, they start coming to conclusions that, you know, it seems a little bit freer, right, from that, um, from whatever kind of bias pushback they might have, right? So students can tell the author's bias. And this is just kind of a heat map. This is one of those like associative heat maps for the ways in which people associate two words with one another. So just an example. Um, so, in, and in my course, really what I want students to understand is the exigence, right? Uh, the thing which necessitates the creation of language. And this is exactly what I'm about to show you in Policy Map. Uh, I had a very hard time teaching exigence before I started using Policy Map. Because now the students, before they assign any language to anything, they are creating and curating the scenario with which they are now about to birth language, right? In order to explain it. Um, so let's let's take a look at policy map here. Um, so this is just a screen grab, right? Of a of a quick visualization that I did in policy map. 
This is the second assignment that I do with my students um, because obviously I don't just throw them into the deep end, right, with, with a, a data software. We do a little bit of preliminary work with talking about data and working with data and all of those things. Um, but this is the second assignment. So I'm going to show you the assignment sequence in, in, in a moment. The policy map is a really incredible tool. It, you can um, create three layer maps and you can take the data and you can visualize it onto, onto a map here, right? And you can use any zip code in the United States. I have lots of students who come from California or Florida and Chicago and they want to they want to do their hometown, right? So they just type in their, their zip code and it brings them right there. So really, really useful and cool tool that allows students to visualize hyper-local data. Now, this is one of the first uh, assignments that I show them uh, in Policy Map. I take them in and I give them a tutorial and these are the parameters that I set, right? So what we're looking at here is uh, estimated percent of all people who are Black or African American between 2015 and 2019. This is all census data, by the way. Um, estimated percent um, of all people that are living in poverty uh, as of 2015 and 2019. And then the existence of brownfields. And what brownfields are, are um, I think they're defined as a space with some kind of um, pollutant, right? There's, there's, you know, sometimes it's abandoned factories that, that haven't been properly cleaned. Um, oil tank spills, right? Things like that um, can can categorize as, as brownfields, I believe. Um, and so what I what I do is I show them this. And as you move these parameters, right? Right now we're looking at where the population is 38 to 99 percent, right? And then from 5 percent to 45 percent, right? Those are big parameters. As you move them, the picture will change, right? The purple will either grow or it will shrink. These little bow ties are the brown fields, right, and those areas. Now, when I show students how to build this map and we play with the parameters and we're tinkering with it, we look at where's the largest clusters of brown fields, right? They seem to be hugging the purple, right, with some exceptions, but they seem to be hugging the purple populations. You can sort of see that relationship. Then what I do is this is the scenario. This is the situation. We just built it. We didn't say anything about it. Nothing has, nothing has been done about what we think, what we believe, what needs to be done, whatever. Then I tell them, if you had to explain this in, in a sentence, if you had to write this in using language, what, how would you do it? And then that's when, that's where the gears start turning. This is the exigence, this is the scenario. Now they have to create the language, they have to birth the language to, to sort of breathe it into life, right? And that's where, the huge critical thinking benefit comes in um, because they have to account for in say a thesis statement or in a cluster of thesis statements, right? Maybe three sentences. They have to explain the percentages of, of the different parameters, the brownfields, sort of maybe what they are. Um, you know, so there's this just a high level explanation that's happening and they have to do it in a clear way. Uh, another really great benefit of this is uh, having students explain why they set their parameters um, is a really great practice in sort of just just sense making. Um, why why do we set our parameter for um, people you know living living in poverty from five percent to forty five, right? Uh, and then I say, well, how do you know what to set it as? What do you define as a low, a medium, and a high poverty level for a community? Well, my students go out there and they say, well, what's the national poverty level? Um, what does it look like in comparison to that? What's the poverty level in New Jersey? Even more local, what's the poverty level in Newark, right? What's the poverty level in Jersey City? Do we feel like the areas that we're looking for are outside of the norm, right, for, for what we statistically can see in, in the census data? Those are those kind of ideas that they're not necessarily going to start picking up on from just normal researched article reading. These are the, those are like the high level things that will later now be supplemented by the, the traditional research uh, articles um, that I think just adds an incredible amount of value uh, to their work. So here's the strategies and steps. So I'm going to take you through all, all of the assignments um, and everything. So analyzing a data narrative, we start by looking at data narratives that are out there in the world already that exist that I think are particularly good. And that's their email assignment, right? They're writing to me. Understanding visualizations, that's a lecture and a discussion. That's where 
you know, I'm really trying to equip them with that, that utility belt, right? That tool belt of, of vocabulary. Uh, rhetorical strategy synthesis, right? That's where the theory and the practical meet. That's another lecture. Um, uh, document design, right? Uh, lecture and analysis. Um, so talking about the space of the page. Uh, scaffolded research um, in, in a sandbox. That's paper number two. That's the policy map one we were just looking at. And then my favorite thing, which I'm really excited to share with everybody, is the research project presentation using Sway. I am presenting to you right now in Microsoft Sway. If anyone was wondering uh, what this tool was that I was using. Um, so this is like a small plug for Sway. I, I like it. It's fun. Um, all right, so assignment number one. This is the, uh, and I have everything here, and I'll share the link to this presentation so that you can kind of uh, you know, take some of take some of the assignments if you want. You can adjust them as you as you need. Um, this is the first assignment. It's very simple. It's a one page assignment. I ask them to uh, read an article. They can pick from six different data narrative articles, and I ask them to read it and then to write me an email making a case for why they think it's it's a good article for us to study the the topic of data narratives and. Um, you know, and, and business writing, right, as just a general concept. Uh, these are, here's, you know, for, for all you QM folks out there, um, here's, here's, your, uh, here's your learning modules or, you know, um, your learning objectives. And then uh, here's kind of my lesson organization. I try to split things up so that it's clear to them what's a general writing thing and then what's more writing in context, right? So uh, I store like the, the Lloyd Bitzer articles, right, on, on rhetorical situation. I store them in one space. And then I, I, I segment everything out for them, um, which is, has been successful so far. But here's the articles, right? Um, here's just some quick kind of screen grabs from them. Really amazing, really incredible uh, data visualizations. And it's good, I think, to start with this because it shows students that there's a real world market for this. Um, over this past summer, I saw some of my first data journalism job postings um, on LinkedIn, which was very exciting for me. Uh, and so I think that this is very much a more popular mode of communication, and we're going to see a lot more of it. Um, but here's just some of the topics that they cover. Tracking poverty camps, right, in Bangladesh, redistrict, redistricting American elections, right, about gerrymandering, uh, the train from, a train from China to London, the myth of the criminal immigrant, spy plane routes, um, which students love writing about that, but they don't always write particularly well about it, but it's an interesting article. And then I give them the World Health Organization COVID-19 dashboard, which is a just massive database. And that's for like my more brave students, right? The ones who really want to do a deep dive. There's no one article in there, there's thousands. And so they can go through and find, if they can find a, a, a data narrative of their own, they can use that. I've only had a few students attempt that, but it, there's always some some pretty solid results. I don't think that they want to really think about COVID more than they have to. So I think that's that's part of it. Um, and here's some of my results, right? Um, and this is just essay number one. So you have to imagine they're a week or two into the semester. They have never done data writing before. Many of them, most of them. Um, and at this point, these are, these are astounding results for me, right? They're putting images. They're designing images into the into the page, which seems thoughtful. Right with their placement, uh, and not only is that, but they're writing about the genre of a data narrative, right? And and how webs how websites are designed, and they're thinking critically that way, right? So um, here I'm I'm not going to obviously read the the whole examples, but um, you know this crisis is severely underreported, even though it has been going on. Uh, the largest camp, right, is now home to nearly 600,000 refugees, and many more um, live in similar makeshift camps, right? So we're seeing just this fluctuation between the macro and the micro that I really think is one of the huge benefits of assignments like these. Not only are they dealing with just data, but they're, they're looking at a human component, which is, you know, as, a, as someone who's teaching them writing, that's just like, you know, I, that's what I love to see. Um, you know, that's, that's kind of a brilliant aha moment. And then this student over here is actually, I mean, she really went above and beyond. Um, she's analyzing, right, like how it's designed, right? And this way, the interactive map targets both general populace and individual simultaneously, right? Talking about the drop down bars and the way that, you know, people can navigate it. Um, so really, really cool and interesting work um, that, I, that I'm getting out of it. Uh, and, you know, maybe it doesn't, you might not feel the impact of that, but I read about two semesters worth of just emails, right? Just email, just email assignments. So now this is way more interesting for me as well. Um, so here's our step two. This is where 
I'm really taking them through a deep dive of, of vocabulary. Uh, and, you know, I, I don't, I don't test them on it. I don't, I don't put too much pressure around it, but I just want to start exposing them. So there's this great Tableau uh, visualization. It's actually, I think, the most popular Tableau public uh, link ever. Um, it's called the Visual Vocabulary Tableau, uh, and um, by Andy Andy Kreibel, I think is how you pronounce his name. Um, I actually watched him speak during the uh, the Tableau conference this past year. He was pretty good. Uh, and so this is the link down here, uh, which you can navigate to it. I find it it takes a while to load, so I just put some screen screen grabs in. But it has all these different tabs, so you can go and see. Maybe students love to talk about correlation. You know, even <laughs> they very rarely do it. Um, I would say like on the nose well, but they try. But so I I always show them correlation, and we sort of talk about correlation and what that is. Uh, for the policy map assignment, we go to spatial, right? Which is which is where they're talking about the maps. But I think this is an amazing resource. Uh, when you click into those individual tabs, this is the type of work that you get, right? An example of the graph with a very quick and easy understanding of when people use it and why they use it, right? Connected scatter plot usually used to show how the relationship between two variables has changed over time, right? Um, and, you know, it's just a brilliant piece of work, I think, like, and this person's giving it away for free. So, you know, I would, I would take advantage of it. And here's the spatial. So this is definitely a space where I, I bring my students. Um, this is usually what they're doing, the basic choropla, choropla. I think that's how you you pronounce it, right? You're talking. They're talking about the ratios, right, that are put placed onto the map, um, and how they exist in a geographic space. Uh, some of my students, as they as they use Tableau um, for their final project, uh, will be using the proportional symbol, right, the count and the magnitude, things like that. Some students even do dot density um, or heat map, but those are more sophisticated things in Tableau. Uh, so you know, usually they stick. They stick kind of to these two areas, which are a little bit, you know, a little bit simpler for them. Um, but again, uh, just an amazing resource, right? That I, that you should definitely take advantage of. Um, here's just some some of the intermediate steps, which I don't want to spend too much time on because, uh, you know, I, this is like rhetorical theory stuff. <laughs> so it, maybe it might not be super useful for you if you're blending it into your classes. But rhetorical strategy synthesis, right? That's where we discuss the rhetorical situation and develop a vocabulary utility utility belt, right? I'm a big, my students hear me talk about Batman, I don't know, all the time. Um, you know, you, your vocabulary utility belt. And I tell them, when you first start writing, you should just jot down a list of your 10 vocabulary words that you think you're going to need to really address this topic and to give it to your audience. And then as situations arise, you can whip out your different tools, right? And the cool thing about the vocabulary utility belt is that it changes as it repeats itself. Um, you'll excuse me, I hope for quoting Andy Warhol there. Um, but you know, that's that's really the name of the game, and it really helps students see that that recursivity kind of idea, right? That their language is a living, breathing thing that's going to grow, right? As as they as they move, as it repeats itself. Uh, document design, um, you know, the those Microsoft Word documents that I just showed you, those do not happen by magic. <laughs> you know, you have to. You have to show students how do you do wraparound text? How do you crop images in Microsoft Word? Um, how do you place things in there? It takes about a class. Um, in, in my online classes, I, I have a, a 10 minute video um, that I put up and, and now it's made, right? So I can just use it semester after semester. But document design is a big one, especially when you're thinking about relationship to audience, right? So not only, okay, that's great. You took all this information and you threw it out there, but how's your audience gonna receive it? Um, so getting them to think more about, about that reader-friendly design. And now here's our policy map assignment, which I already sort of gave you some previews uh, to. But um, here, here's the whole assignment. You know, you can, I don't want to run out of time, and I want to make sure I leave, leave time for questions. So I'm not going to read the whole assignment, but it's a persuasive assignment. I ask them to go into policy map, create a three-layer map based on different parameters that they think have a relationship, but maybe they have a hypothesis behind it. And then start creating language based around that map that they can now make some kind of an argument. Uh, a lot of students, I ask them to sort of show me the drama in the ways in which the data moves, which is something that they they almost will never get from just a traditional research, uh, you know, scenario. So um, here here's the assignment. 
It's segmented out for them. Um, I'm a, a huge, huge believer in sort of scaffolding assignments, right? So one day we'll do pre-writing. Another day we'll do play around in policy map, um, you know, and send me the visualization and write a little blurb about it, right? Uh, the next day we'll say, okay, write your thesis statement. Now that you have a thesis or a hypothesis, um, go out there and start researching for articles that either agree or that challenge, right? The, the claim that you're making. See, see if the data can kind of push back against them. I'm a big believer in you have to stress test your assignments, right? You have to, you know, <laughs> whatever visualization you're putting out there, it's got to hold up, right? You got to, you got to kind of flood test it, right? So uh, here's, and here are our trusty um, learning objectives. So you can check those out. But here's, you know, I wanted to show this in particular. This is a student who, um, a really good student, um, sometimes struggled, though, I noticed with, with kind of writing very clearly. Uh, and I, th I think said that to me um, once, uh, that, you know, they sort of had issues with that. And I just want us to, to just take a peek at some of this writing, because this is a student who maybe in some early writing, I... I, you know, or in any other class, I would have said, you know, needs needs work in certain areas. And you can see, right, there's there's just issues with the writing in general. I mean, there's, there's um, you know, there's typos in places, there's double duplicate words, there's all these things, but but look at what they're doing, right? The data depicted show, shows in purple, right, the estimates of all predominantly black neighborhoods in nor Northern Jersey area. Um, it also shows all the neighborhoods with at least a quarter of the entire population classified as poor by New Jersey standards uh, and a probable risk of exposure between moderate and high. 25% poverty rate uh, and risk of lead exposure, right? Like, I, I mean, the, the way that they're layering those statistics is, you know, it might not seem like anything to you, but for someone who works in first year writing, right? This is, I mean, this is miraculous work, right? This is a sophistication that I, I haven't necessarily seen from just fresh, you know, freshman level, sophomore level writers who are writing perhaps outside of their, their thesis, right? Or outside of their discipline. The thesis, you know, when they're writing their thesis, there's a little more heft to it. So I think they also just take it more seriously and, and perhaps go to the writing center and all that stuff. But, you know, this student is grappling with these three layers in a way that um, really produces incredible critical thinking, uh, you know, development. Uh, so, uh, and here, you know, here's another, here, here's just another result, um, right? The drama through change. Uh, so the student is placing these, you know, these visualizations into their actual uh, Word document. And this was one of my favorite because this is how hyper-local you can make it, right? Um, they're talking about the lead in, in the water in Newark. And look what they did, right? They highlight where the lead stops, which is Seton Hall University, right? And that's that was one of those like, goosebump moments for me as a professor, right? Because I'm there sitting at Seton Hall and the student is showing me, you know, that there's lead in the water like just over there, right? And that there seems to be a clear sign um, of some injustice happening, right? If that's, if that's where the line stops, then something must be happening, right? There must be some argument that's, that's being made there. Um, so again, just really hyper-local, uh, you know, um, opportunities there. Uh, so let's see. I don't want to run out of time before there's questions. Um, so assignment three, right? And this is the full scale research project, which we do in Tableau. And then we have presentations in Sway. Um, I make for my business writing class, because it's, it's somewhat intense, I make Tableau optional uh, for the last project, although I'm moving towards using it as a requirement. Uh, I've made it optional so far because uh, I didn't necessarily feel totally confident in my ability to teach it, right? Um, so I wanted students, I would expose them to it, and I wanted students to say to themselves, like, I, either I feel comfortable learning this new tool or I don't. Um, I'm feeling a lot more confident about it now where I want to move towards making it a requirement, but only for my full semester courses, not for probably not for my summer or for my winter session classes that are that are just so fast, right? Too fast, I think, to to really learn Tableau. So, I, I post instructional videos um, and I can sort of let them feel it out. If they don't want to use Tableau, they can just continue to use Policy Map or any other data visualization software that maybe I've just done a one a one off kind of class on. Uh, everything again is really really scaffolded, right? So we have part we have four parts to this paper. 
there's a lot of, we do a lot of meta writing. Um, meta writing is where learning happens, right? When it comes to writing. Uh, so I, I'll, I'll, I sort of insist on that in my classes and we, we do rough draft and final draft. So they get a lot of comments back from me. But here's the most exciting part, right? Which is part four, the presentations where I'm asking them to create their own data narratives. The exact same, like those data narratives that they that they read. Now this is where everything comes full circle and they have a living interactive thing that they can now put in their portfolios. Uh, the first draft of this presentation, I had my actual full semester on here and the last couple weeks of the semester, we do interviews in business writing. Um, I, I actually pulled that off because I didn't think I would have enough time to talk about it, but the interview moment is really where a lot of the synthesis happens because I pretend to be an employer. I look at their portfolio and I say, well, what are you, what are you doing here? You know, where, where's the transfer, right? What's the moment of synthesis? And they have to explain to me, well, here's the skills that I learned here that I can now take into a workplace. Um, what, what have I learned in school that I can now carry here working with software? Um, I tell my students, listen, you do not undersell yourself. You were a student during a pandemic, right? Which we asked you to go from fully in person to fully online, to hybrid flexible, to fully online, right? To, you know, again, whipping back and forth. And um, they managed it, most of them. And even if they didn't, they still did, right? Beautifully, right? They just, you know, um, and so the skills that they gain towards that, they have earned the right to talk about it. I think at this point in their interviews. And so this is part of, I think, weaving this these skills into that narrative, right? Which is that I, I feel like a digital citizen now, I can communicate over digital spaces, I can do all of my research through remote digital spaces and I can create this thing, right? This, this kind of lovely thing that I have here. Um, so this is my instruction, which I make videos with, you know, like sort of a walkthrough, but here's the student results that I wanna, wanna show you. Um, these are their, these are just screen grabs from their data narratives, right? Uh, a lot of my students love to use open source data that deals with sports, of course, and Tableau's open source data begins with sports, so they're kind of asking for it. Um, but lots of my, lots of my online students are athletes. Um, I think that's just how their schedules work out. So you'll notice here, right, that they'll, they'll be building these kind of scrolling data narratives, and a lot of them like to write about baseball and soccer. Um, but here's an actual, this is a full scale, uh, uh, data narrative, right? This is a full scale, a Microsoft Sway that a student built and it is just absolutely stunning, right? And this is what I was talking about before about how you just get more specific um, uh, topics, right? So Flint, Flint's lead crisis turned into an edu education crisis, right? Um, I, ha I have gotten a few essays over the years about uh, Flint, Michigan's lead crisis. I've never gotten it so specific about um, special education programs, right? So just some really fascinating work. Um, you'll note, you may notice uh, sometimes this moves, the picture, the images move, but I think I have to go into full screen, right? And so this is the student's work. Um, as I scroll, it's just a cohesive narrative with really beautiful and stunning images. Um, it is, hold on, let me find it. It is interactive. There's a, oh, here, this is, I love this. Um, so you can see, 2017, 2014, right? So you can scroll this from side to side. Um, and this is just sort of the, the best of the best of student work that I've gotten. Where in past semesters, um, I have, you know, I've gotten just research papers, right? Or I've assigned research papers and I sit there and I read them and then I grade them, I give them back to students and they never look at them ever again. And they certainly don't bring them to an interview, right? This now, a student can take this to an interview and they can say, look, this is a project that I worked on. This is something that I built. Um, these, these are so these flip, right? So you can click on them and they flip back and forth. And you might think that this is a difficult thing to do, um, but the way Microsoft Sway works is it's actually pretty easy for them to to kind of grasp this and and work on it. Um, and so, so that's that's my results. That's my presentation. I'll I'll take uh, when we come back. I'll stop sharing my screen. I'll take questions. People have them. All right. Well, thank you, Greg. Great. Absolutely great presentation. I think Chelsea has a question. There you go. Yes. <laughs> oh, OK, just making sure I was unmuted. Um, I think Ming had a question before mine. So um, 
He asks, what is Sandbox? Is it a software tool? Right, so uh, the phrase sandbox is, I use that to refer to just a piece of software that you're sort of throwing students into. Um, so policy map, I'll, I would refer to that with my students as a sandbox, right? I would, because because I'm I'm putting them in there and I'm saying, go play, you know? <laughs> so it's like, it's sort of like a sandbox and see what kind of castles you can build and see what kind of things you do. Um, so Sam, my dogs are going to start, the mailman's here, so my dogs are going to go through you, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, sand, sandboxing is more of a theoretical kind of term. Okay, and then my question, <clears throat> well, I have a lot of things to say. I think that Sway is amazing. Um, for those of you at Seton Hall, it's included in our Microsoft 365. So explore, explore, explore. explore. <laughs> <Right. laughs> um, but I think it's amazing, especially that last presentation you showed us where you know they could flip pictures and that is amazing. So um, what advice do you have for professors who maybe want to implement something like Sway or even policy map into their classes that aren't typically data oriented? Right, so what I would say is um, start small. Uh, my class started with policy map and that was it. And it was just the persuasive paper. Um, and then I saw an opportunity. So then I, I probably went even faster than I should have, which is like the next semester I was like, policy map, Tableau, <laughs> you know, <laughs> down there, you know, slay. Um, but I would say start slow. You know, if you are if you're teaching, especially an upper level course, and you have a lot of stuff to get to, you know, um, see what you can kind of work in and where you can work it in, even just one assignment makes a huge difference i think by saying like okay we're gonna we're gonna use policy map for this assignment i'm gonna ask you to include visuals uh you know just that one thing will make a big difference and then see what happens you know if you have success with it you start rolling out maybe more digital interaction for every assignment um i got so excited by the digital component that i was like okay every uh, let's we're going digital you know um <laughs> this is us uh so and I think that because I was I was teaching an online class as well, so that was also it just made a lot of sense um, for me. But you know, you don't want to. I, I don't want professors to make more work for themselves mid semester. Uh, you know, it, it does take some time to learn these things. Tableau has a learning curve, um, but you know they have a, also have a lot of free resources for professors to learn. So uh, I would definitely recommend it. Right. I have one more question. Um, what do you think is the learning curve for Sway? Because now I want to play with it. So, so is it going to take a long time? Like, what, how did you see your students also right. adapting to it? So this is actually the, the Sway that I showed you at the end. I would, I would argue that that is like the best of the best. You know, that student went like hands on with it in, in a really big way. But what I actually have my students do is I have them design their projects in a Microsoft Word document with the images in a narrative way that sort of flows and I have them bold their subsections and if you click on file in Microsoft Word at the bottom it says transform and you can actually transform the document into a sway so you click transform a little thing opens on the side and it gives you all these different templates and you just click like go go try it like today you know like um, it gives you all these templates you click on it it shows you how it will be viewable on your desktop or on mobile which is really cool and then you do it and there's your sway and it generates it for you automatically um, so i have students do that first and then and then i tell them to go edit and you know what does what doesn't look quite right you know what looks kind of funny um, when i start way I was just building I was building from scratch and it, it takes a while you know it takes a really long time um so yeah I would uh, that's the the quickest way to get started in sway you can start you know transform a document and see what happens you know thank you for all the shortcuts <laughs> <laughs> right I know I know listen I've worked out you know all the <laughs> all the issues and um I I'm good for finding shortcuts for people so Thank you. Yeah. I have a question, uh, Greg. Yes. This is the main farm library. Uh, is Swag a tool and a free tool that we can download from somewhere? Uh, Sway, you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. So Sway is part of Microsoft um, 360. So as long as you have a Microsoft oh, okay. account, I'll do. Uh, another thing is you in one of the slides you you show the uh, 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 something I catch is a language is something routine. 
what is this? Is a uh, tool or is uh, something in one of your early slides? Right. So the mathematical language routines, that's, um, that's something that's being studied by Stanford uh, right now. Um, and they, they're kind of working with this theory that uh, if you teach students how to write through sort of the discourse of math, that both both subjects are, are benefited. Um, and okay. so I'm taking it's not that a tool. Out. It's not a software that we can use. No, it's not a software. It's, okay. it's just a okay. theoretical Thank you. approach. To, yeah, theoretical approach to education. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Thanks, Meg. Um, any other questions? Louisa, is that a hand? Yeah, I mean, you touched on this a bit, but I thought it was interesting how you mentioned, um, like going from teaching the normal English class and teaching business writing. It kind of reminded me of how as a student, like I always, like I was always encouraged, like, oh, write as much as you can. And then like during my internship, I would have summer, it was like managers just looked at me and it was like, the more I can put into five lines in an email, the better. So I was just wondering, like, if you can talk more about how was that for you? And like, why do you feel like you learned from that switch? Right, yeah. So, um, and I'm, you know, when I was in grad school, I studied creative writing. So I really like, uh, you know, <laughs> I really had a, um, a strange transition into business writing myself, right? And what I was asking my students to sort of produce. Um, one of the biggest kind of concepts that, I have to teach in business writing is actually not so totally isolated from creative writing or just essay writing, which is this idea and this concept of narrative compression, right? It's like, how do you take something big um, and smush it into a small space? Uh, you know, I don't know, this might, be, I might be revealing myself as like a, a nerdy person, but um, did anyone kind of like, you might remember there was some, uh, some controversy over Peter Jackson making The Hobbit into three movies, right? And then, you know, and then other scenes would have like a full paragraph and he would just kind of like, he would stretch it into like 30 minutes, right? Um, you know, that's narrative compression, right? It's like he, you can contain so much information in a single sentence that it can span hours or it can span months. That doesn't translate, you know, in the same way. Um, so I, I focus on that with my students, especially what I, what I do a lot, especially with the email is, um, you know, I, I tell them that the challenge of the assignment is, is doing that, is taking, you know, a large, large amount of thought and putting it into five lines, right, in, in an email. Um, so it, that's true, you know, it's tricky. I mean, I have students who sometimes like they write a two page email and it's brilliant, you know, and I love it. And then I'm like, but you know, what's the what's the audience going to feel about this, you know, and how are they how are they digesting it? So, you know, I'm right there with you. I don't I don't have like a complete answer to that. But I, I it's, it, that's that's one of my primary struggles is is teaching that to students. I mean, I keep all of our assignments really short. Essay two is only three pages. Um, essay. Essay four eventually becomes that larger project, but the amount of writing they're doing is about four pages, I think, total. And that includes the essay and that also includes the um, the meta writing and uh, the pre writing. So I'm trying to gear them up for that world where uh, there's an economy for their language, right? And they have to be they have to be frugal <laughs> when, when it comes to how they spend it. Um, did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, I just thought it was funny how you mentioned that and just from my experience too. So definitely, definitely learning curve for everybody, I guess. Right, yeah, it's very weird when um, you're used to writing a, a five page paper and then you have to write an email in two sentences. You know, you're like, yeah. <laughs> that's it, yeah. You run out of words fast. That's a good point. All righty, is there any more questions? Otherwise, that was a fantastic, rich, tremendous, uh, tremendous presentation. I love that visual with uh, Newark and uh, South Orange and with the water. That was like uh, amazing. Anyway, yeah. that was really unbelievable. That was cool. It was all cool, but that was I was wow. That was like I wow. know that's that was my big wow moment um, from this past semester. So yeah, it was a great student. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. It is amazing. Anyway, yeah, again, yeah, I think it really helps students with critical thinking. I think that's uh, really a benefit for them. Right, hundred percent. Yeah. All righty. Well, thank you, Greg. That was really that was great. Yeah, no, was about Sway, which is good. I think we're all gonna use Sway now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Sway. And that's a that's a Mary Balkan thing. Mary is a. Oh really? Okay. Like, person too so you'll hear from her too yeah i never heard of it until today so i'm glad uh, glad i glad i saw this this is great
Yeah, I think we're both trying to convert everybody. I think. That's <laughs> <right>. <laughs> so. All right, you're apostles. All right, very good. <laughs> All right, great seeing everyone. All right, thanks so much, okay, everyone. Thanks again, Greg. It was Thank great. you. Right. Have a wonderful weekend, okay? You, you too. As well. Hopefully, it won't be too much snow. Bye -bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks. <laughs>